Sarah, as Laura mentioned, thank you so much for having me here. It's been great to get to know you guys uh, today and yesterday. Um, thanks for having FreedomWorks here. The work you guys do is so important. Um, I can tell you we can't do what we do in Washington without the support of our activists because you guys are the grassroots that demand what we need from legislators. And so our allies like Rand Paul and like Mike Lee and Ted Cruz um, over in the Senate and the House, um, Thomas Massey and the whole, the um, members of the House Freedom Caucus, especially Jim Jordan, you guys are, you guys are gonna make that happen and you give us a voice to give you guys a voice, so thank you. Um, like Laura mentioned, I'm here to talk a little bit about criminal justice reform. It's an issue that is really important to people who believe in liberty and believe in the, in the rights of individuals and in the merits of individual life. Um, it's been a long time um, coming at the federal level, brushed under the rug a little bit um, in terms of what, where conservatives are coming from looking at this issue. Um, for a long time, through the late uh, 1980s into the 1990s, we saw a rise in what is known as the war on drugs and on tough on crime policies. And inherently, the idea of wanting to prevent people from committing crimes is not a bad one. Being tough on crime is not bad, but it's better to be smart on crime. There is nothing as tough on crime as preventing crime from happening in the first place, and that is what criminal justice reform is about. The reality is, um, this movement started in the states to work on making sure that they're called correctional systems. You know, our prison systems and our jails are meant to correct people and to help people who have had problems that brought them there and to ensure that they are corrected when they come out and don't commit more crimes. By and large, our systems have failed to do that, especially at the federal level, but the states are the ones that noticed it first. As we know, the federal government can borrow and borrow and borrow money. And so when their correctional system has grown out of proportion and sucks billions of taxpayer dollars each year, they just borrow more money to pay for it. State governments, as we know, have balanced budgets because they're not allowed to borrow money. And so when states realized following these tough on crime policies and these long, long, lengthy 20, 30 year prison sentences for low level nonviolent drug offenses, that they weren't able to sustain that level of fiscal, um, of fiscal spending on people that weren't threats to society and people who were, while they were incarcerated, were unable to contribute to the economy. And so states, this movement started at the conserv in all the conservative states. In 2007, Texas was the first state, as Laura mentioned, to really start off with comprehensive criminal justice reform. And what does that mean? It meant that they looked at their system and saw that the people going into their jails after they were completing their sentences were coming out and reoffending with very similar problems. This is inefficient. As conservatives, we look at bureaucracies across the board. We look at the inefficiency of the Veterans Administration to take care of our military veterans. We look at the inefficiency of the EPA to actually protect the environment. What does it do? It just harms businesses. But we haven't taken a long, hard look. We take hard looks at the Department of Justice and other things, sure. But we haven't taken a long, hard look at the Department of Justice and the work it does through the Bureau of Prisons to actually be an effective bureaucracy. And this is one that has people that are processed through it. These are Americans that come into the criminal justice system and they have no tools to come out and be a better person. What conservatives stand for is limited government and it's not limited government to look at a bureaucracy and not want to hold it accountable. That's our, that should be our first priority as conservatives. And so Texas did this in 2007 and every year since state legislatures as they operate much more rapidly than Congress, Congress tends to take multiple sessions to really look at an issue and finally get something moved through. But Texas, and then followed by states like Georgia and South Carolina, those governors and state legislatures, all heavily Republican held, looked at their criminal justice system and realized that they were spending too much money and getting no public safety benefit from it. So in looking at those populations, they looked at the people incarcerated and said, who of these people are true threats to society? Who are we using our prison resources on? and where can they be better spent. And so that includes initiatives such as inserting um, programming in prisons, allowing faith-based groups to come into prisons and to give their programming and nonprofits and different um, private sector groups or job training programs for people that when they come out, they can participate in them. And this is important because they were able to then open their prison doors to people that wanted to help those that were incarcerated and when they come out on the, on the back end, not only if they don't reoffend, you don't have another crime, you also don't have another victim, you don't have another community riddled with crime, 
and then ultimately you don't have another fiscal burden of incarcerating someone for longer than they were in before as a result of sentencing enhancements. And so this mo movement, as it grew across the states, um, did reach Mississippi. Um, Mississippi is one of the biggest success stories that we've seen in recent years. Now it takes a while for data to gather up on this stuff, um, but in 2014, the legislature passed and the governor signed House Bill 585. Um, it reclassified and redefined the different drug and property offenses, um, revised some sentencing enhancements, expanded good time and earned time credits, so for those model prisoners who've never had a disciplinary infraction in their time incarcerated, they're able to spend more time in transitional housing. Um, and established and improved electronic monitoring, which has proven in communities to be just, just as safe, if not more safe, than halfway houses. They also implemented a risk and needs assessment program. And what this means is that individuals, when they come into the prison system, there's a comprehensive assessment done of them to say, what got them here? What are the societal, economic, <coughs> social factors that got them here? And what might they need? More often than not, these are drug problems. And a drug problem cannot be treated, and a, and a crime that's committed as the result of a drug addiction cannot be righted without addressing the underlying problem, and that is drug addiction. And finally, um, reforming different specialty courts, which include drug courts, for a diversion from sentencing into prisons and toward treatments for uh, mental health problems as well as drug addiction. And then just requiring simple fiscal statements and data of who is actually incarcerated which types of people are coming out and not reoffending? which types of people are coming out and reoffending within three months, and what can we do about that? And so, um, Mississippi, between 2014 and 2017, the prison population and imprisonment rate in Mississippi declined by 10%, and this saved taxpayers $266 million in spending on prisons. That's a significant amount of money for a state, and at the federal government level, it's even larger. Um, so Mississippi is yet another example of what we at FreedomWorks are able to point toward to tell our legislators in Congress that these are sound policies that conservatives need to support to protect taxpayers. Um, additionally, between 2014 and 2016 in Mississippi, the overall crime rate declined by 5%. And this is astounding, but it's not uncommon to see. Over 35 states in the past couple years have seen imprisonment rates, imprisonment rates decline alongside crime rates. So what this means is that people are not committing crimes on the front end. And that's exactly what we need to be doing to make our communities safer and to be tough on crime by being smart on crime. Um, so to go back a little bit to why this is such an important issue for conservatives and why conservatives need to be championing, championing, championing this as theirs is because A, as we've discussed, it's been large, by and large done by conservative states. But more, moreover, it's about government efficiency. It's about making sure our correctional system actually is accountable to what it's supposed to be doing and that we're not mindlessly supporting and throwing more money at a bloated and failing um, bureaucracy. And what this really means in the end is correctional systems should be focused on reducing what's called recidivism, which is somebody's likelihood to return to prison after they're released from their, from their um, sentence. And at the federal level, this rates around 40%. So any conservative would look at a government bureaucracy that fails its people 40% of the time and say we need to do something to change that. We haven't yet done that with the prison system, with the Bureau of Prisons, and that's what we need to do. Additionally, um, it's a conservative issue because it's about the, the liberty of individuals and the belief that people should be able to uplift themselves through the opportunity that America gives them. When people are incarcerated, there's little to no opportunity in the prisons for them to learn job trade skills or have access to education or anything that on the back end helps their re-entry into society. Um, especially now with our economy doing as well as, as it is, we have more jobs available than we have people who are seeking jobs. And people who are incarcerated, those people, 95% of incarcerated people across America are going to return to our societies one day. We want them to be prepared to take on these jobs and to take on these roles. We don't want them to come back into society and commit more crimes and have more victims as a result, but we'd like them to hold the jobs that we need help and contribute to our economy through their own good and the things that they can offer society. And also then they become productive tax paying citizens and they, they create families and they're, they're your neighbors, they're the people who go to church with you. 
you know, these are people who, if 95% of them are coming back to society, we do need to make sure that they are the citizens that we would like them to be. And that's the conservative belief in second chances. Um, and then additionally, there's the simple societal component. So often our prison system is so broken that those who are incarcerated for not a very long period of time, especially at the federal level, 47% of the federal prison population are drug offenders. And most of those are entirely nonviolent, low-level, first-time offenders. And these individuals, due to the way the system works, are sometimes, you know, they committed an offense in Pennsylvania and they're incarcerated in New Mexico. Their family can't see them. Their children grow up without, without a mom, without a dad, where people, people live in society without their brothers. And then when those individuals return to society, they feel they've been so far removed that they have no tools to go back to it. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about the different aspects of criminal justice reform, where they've been at the states, and kind of where the state of play is at the federal level. In our work at Freedom Works, we engage mostly on federal issues, um, and then insofar as states come into play, if there's wonderful policy across the states, we go out and support it, because the more we can point to the states being successes, the more we can make movement at the federal level. Um, so with criminal justice reform, we have a three, I like to think of it in three different sections. There's sentencing reform, there's prison reform, and then there's re-entry reform. So what this means, sentencing reform most often deals with mandatory minimum sentences. And the idea that judges who we employ to make, to exercise their judicial discretion on what, what punishment is proper for which crimes are unable to do so because they have their hands tied by what are called mandatory minimum sentences. This is not to go out and say, that crimes don't deserve punishments. This is to say that crimes deserve punishments that fit the crime. So individuals who commit crimes, their punishment should fit that and should reflect the crime that was committed and there's no better people to decide that than the judges that we entrust with that power. And so reasonable, small tweaks to some of the federal laws that we have, that even judges have come out and said, I can't believe that I had to give this person this sentence. There's a young man by the name of Weldon Angelos who lived in Utah. And he was arrested for three minor drug sales, um, three dime bags of marijuana he sold to a, to, a, to a confidential informant. And he was given 55 years in federal prison for it. This is due to mandatory minimum sentences. He actually had, the, the way that it worked out, his initial sale was um, in person to the informant and he had a uh, gun on his ankle. He never looked at it, he never touched it, he never brandished it. The second sale, it was in his car. He got out of his car, made the drug sale, and the informant saw the firearm in his car. And the third time, it was at his home. Just for being a citizen that was in possession of a gun, his sentencing enhancement was five years for the first sale, 25 years for the second sale, and an additional 25 years for the third sale. And this, as people who support you know, gun rights and being able to own and possess a gun legally, this doesn't make sense. He never looked at it. These weren't guns that he, it was not a violent offense. He was not a violent man. He was in possession of a gun, exercising his Second Amendment right, and made the mistake of selling drugs. And so this is a man who was, um, actually his sentence didn't end up being commuted, but the prosecutor, I think, 13 or 14 years in, into his sentence, decided to drop the charges. Said that there's no way I could do this. And the judge that sentenced him, who was out of Utah, actually stepped down as a judge as a result of this and said, I can't do this anymore. So these are the types of reforms that we're looking at. They're very low level. They're only for nonviolent, usually only drug offenders, that are more productively, these prison resources that we have are infinitely more productively used on people that we're scared of. Um, Pat Nolan, who's the, who directs the American Conservative Union uh, Center for Criminal Justice Reform, often says we need to be focusing our incarceration on people that we're afraid of, not people that we're simply mad at. And I couldn't agree more with that, and I think it behooves taxpayers as well. Um, the prison reform aspect is a little bit um, simpler, more easy to grasp in terms of what it actually does for people. You'd be astounded how difficult it is to for private groups and nonprofit groups and faith-based groups to have access to prisoners um, in terms of offering them the support that they'd like to. So prison reform is all about opening up the doors to different private, private sector industries, 
to nonprofit groups and especially to faith-based groups to go into prisons and share the resources that they have with those that are currently incarcerated to give them the tools that they need to succeed in society when they come out. That's again, 95% will. And what this means is different job training opportunities or different educational opportunities. Or if you're somebody who's in there on a drug offense, do you have a drug addiction and what do you do to solve that? Did you commit a crime while you, are you, are you mentally unstable? Do you have a mental incapacitation that needs treated? Because if you come out and that's not addressed, nothing has been fixed and the correction has not been done. So that's what prison reform is about. <coughs> And finally is re-entry reform, which what this means is when somebody comes out of prison, they now have a conviction on their record, they've served time in a jail, and they, they encounter endless barriers toward re-entry into society, whether that be housing or whether that be finding education, but especially finding employment. Employment rates of, um, recidivism rates of individuals who come out of prison and are able to find a job that pays over $10 an hour within the first year are three times less likely to recidivate than those that are not. And so what this means is if, if you're even able to make $10 an hour, you, your recidivism rate, likelihood of reincarceration within three years drops from 25% to 8%. And so barriers that we can break down, whether that be through a multiple years of remaining crime free, you can have your record sealed, or whether that be through initiatives in the private sector to do what they call ban the box on employment applications. So a criminal background check is not done until after the offer of conditional employment. And so what this means is it just allows people to make their case and get their foot in the door. And if the company or the, pri or the public sector group so chooses to deny them, then they can. And there are these initiatives to ban the box across the country. The ones that Freedom Work supports, obviously, as we despise government intervention in the private sector are limited to public sector jobs. But private sector groups have taken it on as well. Google and Facebook don't do criminal background checks until after the offer of conditional employment. And I believe um, Walmart and other large, large groups like that do as well because it includes their labor force. These are people who want to work. And if you're tossing them aside just because they have a conviction on their record, you don't know the nature of that conviction. There may be somebody who made a mistake 30 years ago but it's still on there and prevents them from having reasonable access to jobs and prevents them from being able to make their case. So what this is all coalesced to at the federal level is um, the current push for a prison reform bill. And this is something that President Trump had talked about in his State of the Union address at the beginning of the year. And there's legislation both in the House of Representatives and in the Senate um, called the First Step Act. And what it would do, it's focused on prison reform only as well as a couple of small reentry initiatives. It would open the doors of prisons to faith-based and nonprofit groups to come in and offer their, offer their services and what they're willing to give to these people to help them become more productive members of society after incarceration. But what it most importantly would do would create a risk and needs assessment for all federal prisoners. These are people who are currently incarcerated as well as everyone when they come into the prison system. And this looks at their background, this looks at where they come from, their family life, their home, their home life, their economics, their education level, as well as their offense. Where did it come from? Why was the offense committed? What is the nature of the offense? Do they have a drug problem? Do they have a mental health problem? And then after this assessment is done, they're given specifically tailored programming that they're allowed to complete. And for those low-level nonviolent offenders who are proven to be low risk, they're, by the assessment, they're allowed to earn earned time credits as an incentive to complete this programming. And what this means is that it has nothing to do with the length of their sentence. So that's how it doesn't touch the sentencing reform part of things, the mandatory minimums, the, the lack of judicial discretion. It touches, once they're incarcerated, the length of their sentence, they're allowed to earn time credits to serve time in a halfway house or in home confinement or on community supervision to be closer to their families again. And this is a huge incentive. And it's very limited number of days, it will be seven days or 10 days, but that matters to these people and that matters to their families and it's significant incentive for more benefit to society that would allow them to do this. And so what this means is that between the programming offered through the prison as well as the um, private sector and faith-based groups that are allowed to now come into the prisons, these are all evidence-based practices that are proven to reduce recidivism as we've seen across all the states. Um, this is a common sense reform. It passed the House of Representatives with 
um, a strong vote of 369. There were only two Republican no votes in the whole House of Representatives. And this is the full backing of the White House, and it's now over in the Senate. And as we know, the Senate's slower, it doesn't process things very quickly, there's a lot more gridlock, they pride themselves on being the most deliberative body um, in the world, and so they're certainly doing that, they're deliberating and figuring out what the exact balance they want to strike is, but this is something that everyone has been able to wrap their support behind. It makes sense for public safety to reduce the crime rate on the front end as well as the back end. It makes sense for taxpayers fiscally to balance our budget for $21 trillion in debt at the federal level, and it's only going up. And the only way you can stop that, well, you, you need entitlement reform, but you can do what you can. The Bureau of Prisons has a $7 billion budget, I believe it is, and it's going up every year. We incarcerate more people than any other country in the world. And that comes at a tax to the cost rate. It's about <coughs> between thirty-five dollars and $40,000 a year to incarcerate someone. And when you're incarcerating them for that long, and so if they serve a two-year sentence, and they come out and they reoffend, and they now have a sentencing enhancement that their next sentence is seven years long, you're blowing such a huge hole in taxpayer wallets and in the budget that is unsustainable for no benefit of public safety. So this is an issue that conservatives across the board have realized is good for them in terms of belief in the individual, belief in the availability of opportunity in America, as well as for fiscal purposes. So that's what I have. Does anybody have any questions? James. Uh, you a question, but I got preceded with about two minutes or something. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah. Uh, several years ago, a friend of mine 